Welcome to Digital Detectives, reports from the battlefront. We'll discuss computer forensics, electronic discovery, and information security issues and what's really happening in the trenches. Not theory, but practical information that you can use in your law practice, right here on the Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the 77th edition of Digital Detectives. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Sharon Nelson, president of Sensei Enterprises. And I'm John Simic, vice president of Sensei Enterprises. Today on Digital Detectives, our topic is electronic security sweeps for law firms and their clients. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We'd like to thank our sponsor, SiteLock, the global leader in website security solutions. Learn more at sitelock.com forward slash legal forward slash digital detectives. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, PINow.com. Need a private investigator you can trust? Visit PINow.com to learn more. We're delighted to welcome as today's guest, Charles Patterson, the founder and president of Exec Security TSCM, specializing in technical surveillance countermeasures, often referred to as electronic bug sweeps, and has been providing security sweeps for corporations and high-profile clientele for over 20 years. Charles began his career in 1978, working in executive protection and technical security services, traveling throughout the United States and over 40 different countries. During that time, he gained extensive experience with many technologies, including two-way radio, telecom, audio systems, video surveillance, and many others. That led him to start his own business in 1995, specializing in TSCM. Exec Security is one of the few full-time professional providers of electronic TSCM sweeps in the United States, serving major corporations, attorneys, and private investigation firms throughout the U.S. and the world. Thanks for joining us today, Charles. Good morning. Thanks a lot, guys. Well, I got to tell you, Charles, that when I first read the acronym TSCM, I went, what is that? So I was happy to find that it was spelled out, but I am guessing that many of our listeners do not know what technical surveillance countermeasures actually means in the real world. So can you help them to understand? Sure, yeah. The initials are easy to mix up. I hear people all the time going TCSM or they just mix <laughs> the letters up, but that, that happens with an acronyms all the time. So I think the official name originated in the military, but it's technical surveillance countermeasure. So it's how do you protect against technical surveillance? So technical surveillance can be a lot of different things. It could be radio transmitters, bugging devices, uh, microphones, uh, miniature recorders. Uh, covert video cameras are a big you know, concern. Also wiretaps and communications interception. And that can be telephone systems, but it could also be other things, so intercoms, paging systems, conference equipment, any type of audio transmission or you know, video or loss of information through technical means. That's the stuff we want to protect against. And that's where the countermeasures come in. It's not really like the movies. A lot of times you'll see in the movies somebody's waving a little <laughs> black box around, and if it beeps or lights up, they think they found a bug. But it's, it's a lot more. You know, detection techniques can be you know, radio signal analysis. That's part of it, uh, using spectrum analyzers or other equipment. Uh, thermal imaging has become popular in recent years. Uh, electronic uh, device detection from other types of electronic components. And, of course, telecom data, wiring inspection. And a major part of a sweep is a physical inspection as well, where we really want to take a close look at anything that might be posing a threat. Well, Charles, I'm glad to hear that it's not like television. I get the same thing when I, because I don't watch CSI anymore, (laughs) doing forensics (laughs) work. (laughs) So I'm glad to hear that. But can you tell our listeners how TSCM is is related to cybersecurity? Sure. Because, uh, you know, I started listening to your podcast probably a couple of years ago uh, because you're covering a lot of the digital concerns that people face today. Uh, Cyber is such a big concern. The threat is big and the risk is big as well. But there's some areas of information security that may not quite be covered fully by cybersecurity and they may not be covered by other aspects of security like physical security. In the Wi-Fi uh, for instance, there can be rogue access points that you know may not be you know detected or noticed when someone's you know doing a big job with the firewall protecting from the outside. 
somebody on the inside may come along and, and install something uh, that goes undetected for a while. Also, in the wiring and the physical layer of the network, it's possible to uh, put an Ethernet tap that can physically tap uh, an Ethernet line. And there's spare wires in every Ethernet jack. There may be a spare pair of wires that has been known to be used for attaching a microphone to it. Uh, I even found a, a microphone built into an RJ45 Ethernet jack. Uh, using a spare pair so that whoever was at the other end, whether it was at a patch panel or, or somewhere down the line, they could tap onto that and listen into the room conversations. So why do people need to have these kind of sweeps done? Well, I consider three different categories in which when people call us, it's one of these three things usually. One is incident response. Somehow uh, they've detected that information has been leaked or they suspect that information has been leaked. It could be that uh, something was found uh, online on the Internet someplace where they thought, that how come that information got out? Uh, another concern might be if there was a break-in at the company. It may appear as if someone was just trying to you know, commit a, a theft or a robbery, but perhaps that was a cover for something else. Maybe they were trying to plant some device and they're not sure. Or if they're just suspicious about an employee or even an executive who was just fired. Uh, they may say, listen, we need to find out was anything going on that they may have left behind or something like that. Another category is just regular security concerns. Uh, a lot of corporations will have regular sweeps done you know, periodically. Quarterly is recommended, but it could be even uh, semi-annually where there has not been no particular threat, but we'll come in and we'll do a sweep just to make sure that security is maintained. You might consider it like having an, a fire inspection done. Uh, you don't think there's going to be a fire, but you want to have someone go and check, make sure that there's no threats present. And then a third category is when there's a, a very serious or significant uh, upcoming event, perhaps a board meeting or some other type of meeting or conference, uh, oftentimes at hotels, where we're called in in advance to check out the, the boardroom, the conference room, a meeting room, uh, make sure that it's secure, make sure that it stays secure for the duration of the meeting. It's important to understand the risk that's involved, too. The loss of confidential information, that can also translate into loss of dollars as well. The could be corporate strategy, details of mergers and acquisitions, stock offerings, personnel changes, even executive schedules. I used to work in executive protection, and one of the things that they really wanted to keep secret was what's happening in the executives' lives, because that could you know, open them up to some other kind of uh, attack as well. And then it's important to understand who is a possible threat? Who is the enemy? Is it a competitor? Is it a disgruntled employee? Or maybe even an executive who's just jealous, uh, maybe he wants to get ahead, wants to advance his position, or possibly legal issues. Uh, legal problems are another big concern. Uh, all these things together will prompt the company to want to have a sweep done. Well, Charles, who are the typical clients? I'm sure not everybody is totally paranoid and, and calls you up, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think a lot of times the people who call us up, sometimes, as I mentioned, it might be the, what, they, what we think of as an incident response. One of the first things they say is, I never thought I'd be needing this, but, and then they go to, on to explain. Uh, sometimes we're contacted by corporate security. Uh, we work closely with corporate security for a number of different major corporations. They're in touch with their legal department, and they help handle any type of security aspect. But we're also contacted by attorneys, uh, sometimes directly, oftentimes uh, along with a private investigator. There's something going on uh, for one of the attorney's clients where they realize that the nature of the lawsuit, the nature of the concern, somehow it's, it's serious enough that you know, we, need to, that we want to take a good look at it. Uh, there's a number of private investigation firms. Some of them may offer sweeps themselves. Many times they're not equipped to do a a full thorough job, but we work closely with a lot of these firms so that when there is a need, they can call us in and help handle the, uh, the situation. We always ask, whenever I get a call directly from a client, one of the first questions is, have you been in touch with your attorney? Because you're going to need the attorney one way or the other. If we come in and we do find a device, well, they're going to need their attorney to help you know, take the next steps. And even if we come in and we don't find a, a 
suspicious device or, or some significant problem, they still have other issues and they still will need their attorney to try to understand, well, why did they suspect this? Was information leaked? Maybe it came from word of mouth. Nobody wants to admit that they blabbed something, but sometimes we're called in and the security director says, well, we want to make sure there's no bugs here. They think some information was leaked, but just between you and me, we think somebody talked too much. You know, but you know, as a matter of security, we'll go ahead and check the facility for them. You've mentioned a couple of ideas about why lawyers might request a sweep. Are there others? Well, yeah, it could even be for their own offices. Is there some major litigation going on, some major case that is so, uh, you know, that is that significant that you want your conference rooms to make sure that they're secure? Or perhaps you're a firm that's always dealing with these types of cases, and so you need it regularly. Uh, I know some larger law firms have their own TSCM teams that they use uh, to travel around the country and even around the world, taking care of their, their conference rooms there. Sometimes it may just be, you know, a case comes up where they realize this is a high-profile case. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, we're doing the, our fiduciary responsibility. We're making sure that everything is as secure as needed. And then for the clients, a lot of the concern is in the corporate level. So for, you know, legal counsel for a corporation, their own offices may be of concern, but it may be other areas uh, within a corporation and again, as I mentioned before, if there was a break-in or perhaps if an executive was uh, recently fired, the attorney would know if there was uh, any suspicious activity or some reason for concern. And then, of course, there's personal cases, uh, matrimonial cases, uh, even inheritance. Uh, we were called in on a case where uh, a family-owned company, a major corporation, but they were going through some changes and uh, one brother was being booted out. And nobody seemed to like him, and they were very concerned about what information might be uh, changing hands. Well, Charles, let's get into some of the really juicy stuff here and, and tell our listeners, like, how are these sweeps actually performed? And can you tell us something about the equipment, the tools, techniques, those kinds of things, that, including what you might find at the spy shops or on eBay? Because I might want to put some of those on my Christmas list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important to understand understand what... A tool does, you know. Um, as I mentioned, there are small devices that you can buy online that will detect, you know, maybe radio signals, and it vibrates or it beeps when it's near a signal. But it's important to understand there's radio signals everywhere today. There's radio signals from your stereo system. Um, there's radio signals from your computers, your phone, even lighting and room occupancy sensors, all kinds of stuff. So a small little sensor that's very generic, it may not have any discerning of what type of signal you're finding. So we have some fairly advanced uh, spectrum analysis equipment. Uh, the laboratory-grade spectrum analyzer you know, can hook up to the computer. We can run traces and have it detect signals in the whole area showing what frequency they're at, uh, what the waveform looks like. And we can start to analyze where is it coming from? Was this signal present the last time we swept here? Uh, track it down with direction finding. So the radio signals are very important, and we look at that. We also use thermal imaging. Thermal imaging has come down in price in recent years. When I got started in the business, uh, it was a new thing, and you wanted to buy a th thermal imager. probably cost you $70,000 or more. Some military stuff still costs that much. But electronics, when it's active, when it's powered up, it generates heat, particularly covert cameras. Uh, any kind of small camera typically generates a lot of heat, enough that it would be spotted if it was behind a ceiling tile, for instance, uh, in a drop ceiling, from standing on the floor and looking around with a thermal imager, you'd be able to notice that there's a hot spot. And then you know that's something you need to check out. We use uh, also a device called a nonlinear junction detector. It's another one of those long words that uses initials, NLJD. And basically what it does is it detects electronic components. Uh, diodes and transistors and chips, even if they're not active. So even if it's not transmitting, even if it's not turned on, the NLJD or the nonlinear junction detector has a way of detecting that there is a, a component present. For instance, could be hiding in a book, uh, particularly in a law library. There's a, you know so many books. To go through each one manually could take forever. 
So this is a device that we use. That's one you might see if you see any movies with a Secret Service, and it looks like there's a guy with a metal detector going up and down the wall with it. Uh, that's the nonlinear junction detector. And, of course, we've got to look at wiring as well, telecom, data wiring. We look into the outlets. Uh, we use what's called a TDR, a time domain reflectometer. Hey, if you like big words, this is a good field to get into. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the TDR is, is kind of like a radar for wire. It can send a pulse signal down a, a pair of wires and give you a little reflection coming back and tell you what's at the other end. Is it a short? Is it open? Or is there some other component or splice somewhere on the wire? A lot of different techniques like this that are used. And as I mentioned, the physical inspection is probably the most important part of the sweep uh, because that's where stuff, even traces of something that was left behind will be uncovered. We might find a little bit of duct tape stuck under a table. Actually, uh, we were sweeping a, one conference room and it was a very large conference table. And in the center of the conference table, Underneath was a little piece of cardboard stapled in there that formed a shelf. It was clearly done haphazardly by somebody in a hurry. It's the perfect place to hide a recording device. The recording device was not there. What would happen is the person who was doing the eavesdropping would go in ahead of a meeting, crawl under the table, put a little recorder on this little cardboard shelf that he had made, and remove it later. So the recorder wasn't there when we were sweeping, but we did find the evidence that was left behind. So I mentioned there's some limitation with the, the tools that you find online, but it's a matter of understanding what the tool does and then how to use it. It's kind of like, for instance, if someone said, what's the best screwdriver I need to fix my car? I said, well, the screwdriver is one tool. You know, the screwdriver is not going to let you solve every problem, but you certainly may use it. You know, so that's the way a lot of the tools are. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of tools, and it sounds like there's a lot to be found. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there, yeah. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick commercial break. At least 80 of the 100 biggest law firms in the country have been hacked since 2011. Protect your firm and your clients from cyber attacks with SiteLock. Their industry-leading cloud-based suite of website security solutions includes website scanning, web application firewall, including DDoS mitigation, and 24-7, 365 U.S.-based customer support. Give your firm and your clients peace of mind knowing their information is secure. Learn more at sitelock.com forward slash legal forward slash digital detectives. Does your law firm need an investigator for a background check, civil investigation, or other type of investigation? PINow.com is a one-of-a-kind resource for locating investigators anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. The professionals listed on PI Now understand the legal constraints of an investigation, are up-to-date on the latest technology, and have extensive experience in many types of investigation, including workers' compensation and surveillance. Find a pre-screened private investigator today. Visit www.pinow.com. Welcome back to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Today our topic is electronic security sweeps for law firms and their clients. Our guest is Charles Patterson, who is the founder and president of Exec Security TSCM, specializing in technical surveillance countermeasures, often referred to as electronic bug sweeps. He's been providing security sweeps for corporations and high-profile clientele for over 20 years. So I'm listening to you, Charles, and I'm hearing about little cardboard shelves and crawling under tables, and it sounds like this might be quite the process in an office of any size. How much time would it take to do a sweep? It can vary depending on the size of the area and what's involved. Typically, when we're hired for a, a job, we're usually looking at about four or five hours. That may include three or four offices, a conference room. In some cases, you know, depending on how many people we bring, if it's a large area, we may want to bring in a few extra technicians on a job. 
there is a lot of tediousness to the work. Sometimes we have expectation from the client. Again, they've watched the movies and they think we're going to come in. Or sometimes they'll even say, well, the last guy was here. All he did was walk around and wave this antenna thing and, and he was done in an hour. And I say, well, no, we're looking, you know, we're going to be here for three, four or five hours at least. And then the client wishes he brought a book because he's going to have to sit around with us. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, I'll bet that's true. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is. Uh, and at the same time, we have clients that call up, and the first thing they say is, well, we have a facility. It's a 28,000-square-foot facility. I'd like to know what it would cost to have it swept. Well, tell me about that, the, the pricing, because I know our listeners are going to be interested. I mean, is this flat fee? Is it by the hour? And how much would you charge? Give, give me some kind of example uh, in terms of hourly or flat fees, whichever one you use. Well, in the case like I just mentioned, where someone comes starts off by saying, hey, we have this giant facility we want it swept. Well, I say, well, let's, let's talk a little bit. Let's try to understand what's going on here. It's not a simple thing just to give some kind of you know, flat uh, fee without really understanding the concerns. Typically, if someone wants their whole facility swept after we talk with them, they're happy to narrow it down to, say, you know, the four or five main offices. Uh, it's typically like the, the CEO, the legal office, financial office, and conference room, something like that, because they... One is that they haven't understood the depth of the inspection, that it is going to take a long time. If someone wanted, uh, you know, one job we went to started off, the guy wanted about 10 offices swept. But when we got there, he said, well, while you're here, we have offices over here and over there. And I said, look, that amount of offices will be here, you know, for two or three days. So let's narrow it down and let's try to get a handle on the situation. Uh, The cost of a sweep can vary, uh, again, depending on the size. We're often looking between... You know, if it's a local uh, area that we can get to, it may be you know three to five thousand dollars. If we're traveling, it could be you know four to six to eight thousand dollars. Again, depending on the on the size, um, it's not a five hundred dollar job. Just bringing out the equipment. You know, we have probably over two hundred thousand dollars invested in the equipment that we use. So even if someone thought they could rent equipment, it would cost them you know much more than the cost of a sweep. But we try to make it affordable. We try to understand what the nature of the concerns are. When there's a very serious concern, a a serious threat, then the money is not the problem. The the client really wants professional service, and they want it done uh, in a timely fashion. And that's, again, where we're full-time at this. So, you know, sometimes we get a call and says, well, listen, we got a meeting at a hotel tonight. Are you available? And then we'll, we'll try and scramble and get there. Usually we have about, you know, two or three technicians on a job. And as I said, sometimes if there's a really big job, we may uh, look to bring in more people. Well, Charles, how did you get started in this field? And does it require any specific skills or education? Well, it makes me think of, you know, the sign you might see in some places that says you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. You know, yeah. <laughs> or the other one, the other one that says that uh, you think hiring an, an expert's expensive. Try hiring an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. Well, there's a lot of technology uh, that we have to be aware of. My own background, uh, again, I began uh, working on security in around 1978. Now I had aptitude for electronics. I was a ham radio operator as a kid. You'll find a lot of uh, professionals in the TSCM field were or are ham radio operators as well, because we all tend to have a desire to, uh, you know, we like to work with our hands, we like to work with electronics, and we also have a curiosity, uh, curiosity to understand how things work. Again, we want to learn about any kind of technology. I worked with radio as a kid, which meant that I also understood a little bit of wiring, a little bit about microphones. Then when I was working in the security field, I took care of radio systems. I took care of uh, some um, telephone equipment. Like any time the uh, phone company would come to service the telephones, I was the escort to follow them around and make sure that uh, everything was handled okay. And I just kept learning. And any chance I got, I'd try to study something. I Occasionally, the um, company I worked for would hire someone to come in and do a sweep for either a, an important meeting was going on or maybe a conference at a hotel. I would be the escort with the people that were doing the sweep, and I got to see a, a wide range of capability. Uh, some guys really didn't seem to know what they were doing. They would say things that didn't make sense. Uh, again, waving the wand around, I would shake my head a little bit and say, something's not right. And then other times there was 
you know, a team would come in who seemed to know what they were doing. So at one point, I finally uh, decided I'd go for a little training myself. And after I, I took a class, uh, I realized that all of my own interests and all of my own uh, kind of hobbies and the things I taught myself with technology all came together in the TSCM field, decided to make a go of it. And again, a curiosity to understand how things work, a little bit of aptitude in radio, video, data, telecom. But there's an important thing. It's not just being a techie. You need to have a mindset for security because you're going to be entrusted with protecting corporate assets and confidential information. So if someone doesn't really have a understanding of security, they're not going to do too well in this field. Um, it's certainly not like being a spy or being a James Bond character. You really have to be serious about protecting information. Well, give us a story or two, because I know we're running close to the end of our time. Give us a story or two of interesting cases that you've handled. Oh, sure. There's a few. One of the things we didn't talk too much about is uh, voicemail and phone system hacking. Um, this is another area where uh, now some of the stuff uh, may be looked at uh, from a the cyber point of view, but for many years, voicemail has been vulnerable. Uh, one company that brought us in, well, we were brought in with the investigation firm. They had fired an employee uh, who worked in the IT department, and he understood the telephone system. After he got fired, he called in, dialed into the voicemail system, and was able to navigate around the system and discovered that the CEO never changed his default password for his voicemail box. <laughs> so the employee decided he'd listen to the messages there, and he found a message that was an old message from three or four months previous the situation had already been taken care of, but the message was an irate customer who spent five minutes cursing at the boss. So the employee listened to this and thought, oh, here's some fun. He knew what's called the broadcast feature for messages. He was already in the boss's mailbox. He took that message and forwarded it to every employee in the entire company. Oh, so come Monday morning... <laughs> <laughs> All the employees come to work. And every single one of them has that red light flashing on their phone. They check their voicemails. Oh, you have a message from the CEO. So they all listen to it very diligently and hear this irate customer cursing and cursing and cursing. <laughs> so that was a little bit of harassment, a little bit of embarrassment. It took a little while. We were able to figure out that you know that's what had happened. That's the type of thing that you may not expect, but it's something that you got to think about. In another case... Uh, as I, I've mentioned, you know, disgruntled employees and executives, even within the company, in any kind of security, insider threat is a big concern. Well, we found a microphone planted in a ceiling, wired back to an executive's desk. This was in a stock brokerage firm, and apparently he had been listening to the conference room where the SEC and the NASDAQ people would come to do their audits. So he was trying to listen to what was going on uh, with the people that were auditing the company. So he thought maybe he's doing something good, you know, for his firm, but ended up getting him fired. And then to add a little insult to injury, we took the microphone down from the ceiling and noticed that there was a little sticker on it from a spy shop in Manhattan. And uh, <laughs> uh, the attorney then went to the bookkeeper for the company and they did a little search and found that the whole eavesdropping system was purchased on the company Amex card um, oh, gosh. by this executive. So, <laughs> Stupid people. So a little, uh, again, a little embarrassment there, you know, but they were happy to have that resolved. Like I said, I can think of another time we were sweeping executive uh, offices in an executive dining room at a, a technology company, and we were looking at the Wi-Fi. And we know what to expect. We've been there before. We know all the access points have a uh, certain labeling structure. You know, we'll find other things on Wi-Fi. There's, uh, you know, video display equipment, things like that that use Wi-Fi. But here's, here's an access point that's labeled dark web. And we thought, what's, is this a joke or what? So, but we did a little direction finding with the signal. It was not in the area we were concerned with, but uh, we found where, approximately where it was coming from and reported it to the security, who then got in touch with IT, and they were able to find it was a rogue access point that some clever employee thought he was uh, you know, able to uh, give himself some extra Wi-Fi or something like that. So there's a lot of little things that come up that 
it may not be obvious right away. You have to really dig a little bit to find out uh, all the details behind it. Charles, why don't you tell us three tips that anybody can practice to help secure their information and conversations? Sure. It's important, first of all, to understand the value of your information and be careful of what you yourself are saying in conversations. And for a company, establish some good policies so that employees also know that the information that they're handling is confidential. Then from the technical perspective, we always recommend, one is keep an eye out for anything in your office that's disturbed or out of place. If you left the night before and you come back and you see some furniture has been moved, you might want to try to understand why. Was there a cleaner in there? Was something going on? Have uh, ceiling tiles been moved? If you've ever moved a ceiling tile, they usually leave dust behind and the dust falls down. If there's ceiling tile dust on a desk, it may warrant uh, paying some close attention to what's uh, up above. If you have a concern for hidden cameras, uh, there's little devices that you can buy from a spy shop called Spy Finder. It basically shines a little flashing LED and you look through a hole to see if there's a reflection coming back. But you can kind of do the same thing with a flashlight. If there's any suspicious hole, whether it's in a hotel room or in an office, and you didn't notice that hole before, you can shine in there with a flashlight. If you see a reflection coming back, it could mean that there's a camera behind there. It could be something else. It could be an aluminum stud in the wall. But it's something that now you can investigate further, uh, either cover the hole or maybe poke a paperclip into it, see what you hit. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not paranoid, Charles, because you're, you're scaring the, 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 the bejesus out of me here. <laughs> I'm going to look at all the holes in the hotel room walls at this point. <laughs> can you tell us um, how folks would get in touch with you if they had questions or wanted to engage your services? Sure. The uh, website is execsecurity.com. And I'm available by email at charles at execsecurity.com. On the website, we have a blog. It's a news page if you go to the website. Uh, Twitter is at exectscm and Facebook also, exectscm. Well, we sure want to thank you for joining us today, Charles. We've never had the subject discussed before, and it, it's fascinating and a little creepy, too. Not that you're creepy, but the subject is creepy. <laughs> well, we want to protect our information. We sure do. So thank you very much for agreeing to join us today as our guest. Thank you. It's been really enjoyable. Thanks a lot. Well, that does it for this edition of Digital Detectives. And remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please review us on iTunes. And you can find out more about Sensei's digital forensics, technology, and cybersecurity services at SENSEIENT.com. We'll see you next time on Digital Detectives. Thanks for listening to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Check out some of our other podcasts on LegalTalkNetwork.com and in iTunes.